Okay, um, hello and uh, welcome to the inaugural uh, Sciencecapes uh, lecture series. Um, and we're very delighted to have Tess with us, who I'm sure needs very little introduction to many of us. Um, so Emily and I were basically thinking that um, as a legacy of the Sciencecapes network, we're planning to have three times a year a seminar and um, Tess has very kindly agreed to be our first speaker. Um, so Tess is an IKEA research professor at the Universitat Autonoma. Sorry, I have attempted <laughs> to pronounce this so much that I now can't pronounce it at all. Um, Universitat Autonoma de Barcelona, um, an Omni Fellow of Clare College Cambridge and series editor of studies in medieval and Renaissance studies, um, music published by the Boydell Press. Her research focuses on music and culture in the Iberian world in the late medieval and early modern periods, and she's published widely on various aspects of corp culture and the urban science scape. Um, today she'll be speaking on how processions moved emotional discourses in civic ceremony in early modern Europe. And before handing over to Tess, if you haven't already done so, you might want to switch to active speaker view so that you don't get all the um, little um, boxes of people um, staring at you whilst uh, Tess is speaking. Oh, okay. So. I'm just sharing my... Uh, has it turned up yet? Okay, we seem to have half of it already, so I'm looking at half of the screen. Um, oh, ah, now it's a full one. That's a full one, yeah? Yes. Um, I'll just put it into presentation mode. Okay. Um, yep. I'm just trying to, how do I get rid of you all, as it were? Where do I find this presentation mode? Um, okay. Um, if you click on the dots at the top. I should just go to the beginning of it would be useful. Okay. Um, well, thank you very much, Emily, and thank you very much, Rachel, for um, it, first of all organizing uh, these wonderful two days of um, very, very interesting papers. I've learned a lot. And um, thank you very much for inviting me to uh, give uh, uh, this seminar. And I hope I can set um, it off on the right foot. Um, I've, uh, I've got this uh, slideshow and um, I won't necessarily read everything on each slide uh, in the interests of time and patience of you all having to listen to this. Um, so if I go too quickly and you want to come back to a slide, um, I will happily do that at the end. Um, what I'm about to present is very much work in progress. Um, I've only really been involved in working on history of the emotions for the last few years. And it arose out of um, uh, work, uh, recent uh, research that I've been doing in Barcelona um, since I came here in 2011. Um, in particular, a couple of, of uh, research projects, one funded by the Marie Curie Foundation uh, on urban music and musical practices in 16th century Europe. Um, and um, another which is current on the contribution of confraternities and guilds to the urban soundscape in the Iberian Peninsula, uh, circa 1400 to circa 1700. Um, the results of the earlier uh, project, um, I am trying <laughs> to write a book uh, on the daily musical life in early modern Spain, here in Barcelona, 1470 to 1620. And it was really there that um, I began to uh, think about, in particular, um, not just uh, tracking, researching and tracking down um, the different kinds of uh, um, sounds of daily life in, and musics of daily life in Barcelona, but also thinking about the impact of, um, of those on, on the inhabitants of the city. Um, so I became much more involved in sound studies and uh, urban musicology 
and uh, it, this led to um, looking at the history of uh, the senses and the history of um, the emotions. Um, and uh, uh, it also ties into another long-standing interest of mine, which is listening practice, how people uh, listened um, to different kinds of musical repertories in different spaces and, and so on. Um, and reading about, um, reading sound studies and reading things on history of emotions, um, I began to realize that there were, they had a lot in common, these two different approaches. Um, for example, in, in history until relatively recent, recently until the sort of sensorial turn, I suppose, um, the writing of history very rarely actually talked about sound um, or indeed talked about emotions. Um, and these things were kind of hidden. And if you wanted to find them, you had to try to read between the lines and, and find oblique references um, to them. Um, and uh, then my archival research took on a new um, emphasis in that, um, you know, I began to think about all these hidden sounds in the documents, references to musics of different kinds, to sounds of different kinds, and how we could begin to make those um, resound um, by bringing them to the fore and uh, trying to um, think about uh, how those references uh, actually related to what, uh, uh, to history of, of daily life, really. Um, these other things are very obvious that it's very important that we do this in a multidisciplinary context because um, music and sound uh, didn't uh, weren't heard or, or weren't performed in a in a vacuum, um, and we need to take on board uh, other senses um, and other uh, kinds of of history. Um, uh, similarly, the idea of a, of a variety of texts um, so that uh, we can get different perspectives um, on some of the same issues and see them more in the round. Um, contextualization, which has always been a part of my, uh, my research uh, from the very beginning, um, of course, is, is incredibly important. Um, and then looking at uh, historical discourses of um, relating to sounds and emotions. Um, and this is where one has to kind of read between the lines and begin to extrapolate um, patterns of, uh, of sonic and emotional experience. And um, this, a few years ago, um, drew me to the work of uh, Barbara Rosen. Vine, I've got Stein there for some reason, Rosenvine, and um, uh, which uh, encouraged me to, to go in this direction um, since she saw that it, it, uh, the study of emotions should inform every kind of historical inquiry um, and it should be integrated, the history of emotions should be integrated into um, all other kinds of history. She mentions social, political and intellectual, but we could easily add material, daily life, sensorial, acoustic, or, or whatever else. Um, and um, again, this idea of contextualization that uh, if we're going to study the emotions of the past, or even indeed the emotions of today, we've got to see how they are shaped and were shaped um, by the cultures in which they were embedded. Um, and uh, actually, this is the introduction by Jan Plamper to an interview with Barbara Rosenwein and others. Um, and uh, again, emphasizes this idea of this very fundamental idea of how we must consider emotions in context, um, since they depend on values and situations that elicit them, on the um, narratives of people make sense, um, used to make sense of themselves and the world, um, and on the, uh, um, I can't read it all, you see, on the accepted idiosyncratic modes of expression that are employed um, to communicate them. Um, so uh, this is what seems to me important, that we look at context, that we look at discourses, um, 
as William Reddy said, we, we can never be sure, actually, even now, um, if the feelings that are expressed are um, purely conventional, idealized, um, manipulative, or in fact, deeply felt. Um, so we're not, or I'm not anyway, going to be looking at very much at, at kind of um, individually felt emotions, but much more at the kind of emotional discourses that might uh, allow us to um, understand and perhaps open up a bit um, this uh, uh, sensorial, this relationship between sensorial impact, sonic impact, and um, the em emotional affective aspects um, uh, on, on different uh, social groups in their context. And these, uh, many of these things came up, um, have come up doing my work on daily life. Um, and uh, I think they're all uh, aspects that we need to take into consideration and perhaps question. Um, but uh, experience and familiarity, um, sorry, I've got a cat on my desk. <laughs> um, uh, these um, uh, are, are um, uh, very important since um, ritual and uh, processions in particular um, are very much uh, based on experience, on some familiarity with, with how um, they, they were regulated and organized um, and how um, they entered into the collective memory and formed part of, uh, of shared uh, knowledge, um, which gave rise to, to expectations. Um, and uh, I think that's um, uh, a very important aspect to look at here. Um, so uh, a, a recent uh, definition from the volume, which you probably all know, called Moving Subjects, um, published by Brepols, uh, described um, processions um, as rituals um, being a repetitive, formalized social activity of symbolic character performed within a specific temporal and spatial framework. Um, so uh, the creation of expectation, um, partly also through simply through um, pragmatic aspects such as preparing um, the procession, um, uh, led to uh, an awareness of social norms, um, even control in social behavior and interaction and to questions of identity and uh, values related to uh, both, well, to the community, um, but thinking both of um, acoustic and emotional communities in, in particular. Um, so, yeah. Um, just to remind ourselves of uh, Rosenvine's uh, theory um, concept of emotional communities, um, I think uh, that these some of these ideas have 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 really helped me to to think about um, uh, the musical experiences of daily daily life in the past um, in a different way. Of course, she is a medievalist. Um, and has published um, a number of studies, one of them uh, relating to anger and the expression of anger. Um, and she says that emotional communities are like other communities, but the researcher needs, seeks to uncover systems of feeling. Um, and also as social groups where members adhere to the same valuations and emotions and their, uh, and their of emotions and their expression. Um, yeah, uh, so yes, um, this relates again to the idea of social norms and um, to the adoption of modes of emotional expression that the community can expect, encourage, tolerate and deplore. Um, so um, this relates, I believe, to 
um, a lot of the uh, aspects of Barry Truax's definition of uh, acoustic communities, but I'm not going to go into that right now because we probably have um, more than enough um, to, to look at um, and take in consideration. So um, I'm going to plunge in straight away with um, the kind of uh, document that I've been looking at and probably many of you have also looked at relating to confraternities. In this case, the confraternity of the Holy Spirit in Barcelona, which was mentioned very briefly um, earlier on, um, which was a community of the blind, the disabled, and those members who were not blind or disabled, but wanted to form part of that particular devotion. Um, and um, I was looking at the minutes, very, very incomplete. There are hardly any years of um, these minutes, but there are some at the end of the 15th century and in the early 17th century. And um, minutes, I think, are an interesting document, minutes of meetings. Um, since uh, they are since they are a written record of a verbal discussion. Um, and I was surprised, uh, having read quite a lot of these, um, to find uh, an emotional reference um, in this uh, in the minutes for uh, the meeting on the 29th of April 1487 of this confraternity, um, which basically says that um, this is a, almost an annual uh, item that is minuted, they're always thinking about what they might do for the um, for the feast day, which in their case, their avocation was Pentecost, um, the upcoming feast day, and what should they do? And what they do depends a lot on how many, how much, uh, res how many resources they have at any one time, if they have money to hire musicians, which is obviously um, an aspect common to, to probably the whole of Europe and certainly um, it has been very studied in um, the context of Italy. Um, so uh, what we get here is that um, they're debating what to do on their feast day for their procession and they decide um, uh, it, whether they should have more than one wind band, normally of four players of uh, shawms and cornets and sackbuts, um, or whether they should in fact have two. Um, and they decide to go for two, which was obviously double the expense, um, in order to make the members, both male and female of the confraternity, happy. Um, and I was kind of struck about this. Why would they, why would they be happy? Um, and uh, you know, what, what is the, um, the discourse behind this um, in terms of uh, emotion? Um, it was obviously standard practice uh, as I've mentioned, for confraternities to pay for these wind bands to accompany their processions for all the same reasons that um, minstrels and, and trumpets and drums and, and so on uh, were, were commonly hired, even on, on a salaried basis for, for such events. Um, and uh, up until uh, this point, it is clear that they've only had one copula. But now they want to have two, and um, uh, it's uh, to, to make them feel the membership feel happy. I think one of the discourses behind this is that these wind bands are so firmly associated with um, celebratory, uh, joyous, joyous uh, events. Um, such as uh, the major feast days of Corpus Christi uh, for royal entries and for other celebratory occasions, that their sound is associated with a demonstration of joy, which is something I'll come back to. They're also, this sound is also associated with um, the, uh, the, the more popular aspect of, of these events, um, that is accompanying the dancing in the, the streets and the squares of the city um, every evening over a course of three days. So they're, they're instruments that are, are celebratory, that um, uh, are associated with um, these uh, uh, joyous events, um, and they want to have two rather than one, um, 
because uh, because simply because of that, because it will make the whole thing more more festive. Um, so um, I think also another aspect um, is what I just mentioned about expectations. Um, I think part of their happiness, and there's there's no real reason to think that this is anything other than straightforward, given that it is just a a, a record, a, a minute, um, is because of the anticipation of the event, which will be coming up fairly shortly in May, um, and um, and uh, just an anticipation of a sound event. Or, uh, which they will have um, supported and, and promulgated in the city. We can see by the, I've just included another couple of um, extracts because this confirms, um, this is a little bit later, 1495, but certainly by this time, um, they're obviously hiring two wind bands um, on a fairly regular basis um, because they only have tunics uh, which the minstrels had to wear um, their own tunics and they represent the um, uh, confraternity because they're actually painted, as it says, with poor and disabled, um, poor, disabled and, and blind people. Um, they only have four. That's been the tradition, as far as I can tell, for, for many years. And then um, they say, no, we should get eight because we have the two, the two corpus. Um, so this is a kind of sound um, that uh, meant a lot, not just to, to this confraternity, but to every, um, uh, was, was intrinsic really to every kind of procession of a joyous kind. Um, and uh, I, I, I saw this as, um, well, if we look at Andrew Brown's um, uh, description, definition of a, of a procession as offering a new vehicle for civic authority to project a vision of devotion appropriate for the citizen body and to create the conditions for behavior it encouraged to become the norm. Um, his article is very interesting if you haven't uh, come across it. Um, I think it's interesting for those of us working in a sort of late medieval and early, early modern context. Um, this uh, equation between devotion and emotion, which will come up several times um, in the course of this, this talk. Um, but it, it, uh, we can think of, um, I think it can be interesting, and it's a question I'm raising really, to think of emotions, um, not as feelings, but as, as practices in this context of, of looking at emotional discourses. Um, and uh, this quote from uh, Joe Labani, who's a Hispanist, um, we're not, she, she proposes that it can be interesting to look at emotions, uh, not as states that exist inside the self and are regarded as properties of the self, but to consider not what emotions are, but what they actually do. Um, and uh, I think that equates quite well with um, my, uh, the minutes of this uh, confraternity. Um, and also, with other kinds of emotional behaviors um, that take place in public um, and are related closely to the ritual of uh, processions. Um, again, this is a very interesting article, uh, rather more, uh, rather older, um, but uh, very stimulating about, uh, by William Christian about provoked religious weeping in early modern Spain. Um, and he describes weeping as a learned behavior, both a sign of feeling and uh, a way to excite it, um, to excite emotion. Um, and uh, this is a view that I've, I've come to, to share, that, that emotion is elicited and structured in ritual fashion through participation in public uh, drama. Um, which was a way of uh, communicating or realizing um, the different uh, religious significances of emotion um, uh, th through attentiveness, paying attention to, to people's feelings, um, engendering those feelings um, in, through, uh, uh, and, and realizing those through the public display 
of certain feelings. Um, and uh, reading many, many different kinds of texts, it does seem to be that these kinds of things were uh, deliberately, intentionally encouraged. Um, this is an example, I believe, of uh, how sound becomes an integral part of an emotional practice um, related in this case to the auto de fe. Um, and uh, this involves um, uh, an, act, an act that was designed to move people to pity and compassion. As it says here, this moved everyone to pity and no one was so hard hearted as not to shed many tears as they watched a holy ceremony. And especially um, this feeling of, uh, of uh, compassion and pity was uh, reinforced by the singing of the Miserere, um, in this case, um, by the singers of the chapel of, um, of, uh, of Prince uh, Philip and um, in alternatum with polyphony and plain chant. Uh, in many, on many other occasions, it was, it was very probably um, simply uh, chanted. Um, but because this text was, um, this psalm was sung in so many different kind of penitential um, uh, moments of uh, repentance, pity, compassion, grieving, sadness, um, as in uh, Holy Week and uh, uh, at exequies and um, on all other kinds of uh, occasions uh, where public grieving uh, was required and expected, um, it would have become very familiar uh, to uh, the inhabitants of the city who uh, witnessed uh, these events. Um, uh, so the singing of um, certain texts, I mean, the Te Deum Laudamus is obviously at the other end of the spectrum. And I haven't put in any examples of, of that, but uh, um, we will consider another psalm a bit later on. Um, the sounds themselves, um, the mournful recitation of the, of the miserere was one kind of sound signal in these um, to enhance, if not trigger emotional reactions um, is uh, from a Holy Week procession in Valladolid um, and uh, it, it's, it's quite a conventional, quite a typical kind of description. Um, but I think if we, uh, we look at it quite closely, um, it shows that certain sounds were associated with uh, certain emotions. Um, this is the procession um, on Holy Week where they take Holy Week, where they took the image of the Virgin Mary at the foot of the cross, the theme, the discourse relating to the starbat mater and the suffering of the mother related to the suffering of Christ on the cross, uh, a, a whole discourse obviously very much promulgated by the Devocio Moderna, this identification with uh, Christ's suffering and, and that of his mother. So they have an image of Our Lady um, in a black veil, and before her, this was presumably some kind of a um, polychrome statue or, or something, before her went two trumpeters who played out of tune. Um, their faces were covered and they were dressed in mourning, uh, which led to great uh, sadness and compassion. Um, now, again, this is, this is a, a deliberate and uh, probably fairly familiar um, sound signal uh, of the of the time, um, of course, the trumpets, as I've already mentioned, were the sound of trumpets was very very much related to celebratory festive occasions. Um, it had other uses. I won't go into that right now, but um, they would uh, parade usually at the head of the procession, dressed in their dazzling uniforms, um, or usually in Catalonia of red and yellow. And um, here, they're not uh, in uniform, they're dressed in mourning. Uh, we don't see their faces, they're veiled as is the Virgin, the statue of the Virgin Mary. And they, they play deliberately um, out of tune. And we find this kind of references, and I'm sure some of you have found 
uh, references of this kind, um, not only in context of Holy Week, um, uh, but also in, uh, in royal exequies and um, other uh, events of significant um, public grief. Um, so I think we can talk about um, effective sound signals, which um, are, are drawn into wider discourses uh, such as that relating to um, the Starbuck Mater. Um, I just wanted to, to bring in this as a contemporary definition. Um, this is uh, the famous uh, dictionary of Covarrubias from 1611. Um, it's not a, a it's, I'm not going to explore this very much here, but um, I think it's interesting that um, he defines and other writers of the time also do so um, uh, as a, a kind of movement um, or change um, within the body. So it's really a pattern of the soul that finding expression in the voice alters it and causes a particular movement in the body. Now he's primarily talking about orators here. And so the uh, changes in vocal register, um, I don't know, speed of, of speech or whatever, the, the techniques used by the orator um, move people to compassion and, and pity, to anger, to vengeance, to sadness and joy. And this of course is a whole other trope and a whole other discourse um, that I, I won't get into now. Um, but uh, I think we should see also um, that uh, sound is a kind of, of, of rhetoric in the context of, of ritual, um, that it moves people um, who may or may not be au fait with um, uh, certain discourses of the time, um, but which, um, which will have been familiar to them, which, which will have been things that they would have expected um, to happen in this particular context. Um, I also just wanted another sort of question here um, to, to mention briefly about emotional silences. Often the trumpets are not played out of tune. They're simply not played at all at royal exequies and so on. They are carried by the trumpeters, um, but with the bell downwards, um, or sometimes they're played, and so not played at all, or sometimes they're played with mutes, um, which obviously gives a very different kind of a sound, muffled rather than brilliant, and signals the um, emotional tenor of the occasion in that way. Um, this, is, this is a moment which I think is quite interesting to analyze because it brings up another kind of discourse, which is the discourse of, um, uh, or it's an, uh, it relates to emotions. The emotions that are put on display are demonstrated um, uh, at another kind of event, uh, which is the royal entry. Um, and I'll come back to that in a minute. But on this particular occasion, um, there was a, a, a royal entry uh, was expected in 1585, royal entry of Philip II. Um, and uh, there was a lot of debate about this because uh, at least in Barcelona, uh, when it was the second entry of a king, um, Philip II having already entered in 1564, officially, um, there were no, uh, there was no royal entry, um, and nor uh, um, all the ceremonial and protocol that attended that because um, the king would already have taken the oath. The oath taking is um, this kind of uh, reciprocal political arrangement between monarch and city um, only took place um, in the royal entry. And for that reason, it only happened once. Um, but on this occasion, uh, the king was traveling with the heir to the throne, fit Prince Philip, and he um, would be making his first entry. So there was a great debate in the council about how they should deal with the situation. Um, they looked back to precedents and all the rest of it. Um, and they basically reached the conclusion that because the heir of the throne would be making an entry, that they should make the preparations for all the usual uh, celebrations. Um, in the meantime, um, Philip uh, had 
notified the council that the prince and other members of the family, royal family, were unwell and so would not be able to make a royal entry. Now, there were political reasons behind this, um, because according to the chronicler, who was a member of the royal household, um, Enrique Koch, he, um, in his chronicle, describes how um, it, it was no longer deemed appropriate that the monarch of Spain should have to um, observe the um, and swear to take an oath to observe the uh, traditional uh, uh, and very ancient um, traditions of um, Catalonia, of the Catalans. So he sent this message, which seems to be in a ploy to get out of a royal entry. Um, and at the same time, he entered um, in secret the night before um, when the day when the uh, royal entry should have taken place and let the councillors know that he was already in the city. Um, so this threw protocol into great confusion and um, nobody really knew what to do, um, but nothing happened. There was no royal entry. And instead of that, um, there was a silence throughout the city. Um, and so it, it, instead of, of having sound being generated from a multitude of different uh, performative places in the city, um, and nothing happened, it, it was silent. And this, of course, unleashed a whole lot of other kinds of emotions. Um, and uh, the councillors were affected because they had effectively been outwitted um, and were very angry about it. This is all recorded in the minutes of the council meetings. And the citizenry, the, the, the inhabitants of the city um, were upset because, um, they were not able to have their usual kind of rejoicing and the parties and, and dancing and music that went with that. So silence could also be um, interpreted very significantly in relation to emotions. Um, so here again, we have another very similar uh, definition of emotional performances as being repeated acts and, um, and giving the appearance of a stability. Um, our, our, the brief description I've given of the events of 1585 actually threw that stability um, awry. Uh, it was resolved um, rather, uh, what's the right word, reluctantly and half-heartedly, and they did have some celebrations afterwards, but no royal entry procession as such. Um, and um, uh, the uh, this idea of there being uh, a whole range of texts, um, artistic objects and uh, rhetorical devices um, uh, reinforce this idea of the procession as a performance. Um, and I think um, this point is, is really important and, and perhaps can't be said enough that if you see the, if you see um, uh, the representation of emotions as practice, as performance, then whether the monarch feels the emotion is completely immaterial. It is the performance that counts. Um, we can never know how the um, monarch uh, or any individual actually really felt. Um, and uh, it, I see that as anachronistic kind of uh, approach uh, that probably in, in historical terms is, is best avoided, but maybe some of you disagree with that. Um, yeah, and this is another handy little quote. <laughs> Corporate ritual is effective because it is effective. And those organizing processions, as we've seen in the case of the city council, and as we've seen in the case of the confraternity of the Holy Spirit, um, were actually aware of this. Um, and, and to them, um, it wasn't a question of, of um, stirring up emotions um, as individual experiences. Um, it was uh, more to establish a kind of emotional uh, communality, um, a feeling that anybody who's been to watch Barca will have um, 
you get absolutely swept up with the um, the crowd at the football pitch. At least you don't anymore, but maybe it will return. Um, it's infectious. It takes over, and um, this was uh, deliberately uh, enacted um, and performed um, during um, major processions. Um, and I think this uh, little uh, extract from the ceremonial of the city, the Libra de los Solemnitats, um, which was maintained from middle, the Middle Ages through until um, the 18th century. Um, the illuminations and music and castles of fireworks and a place to be, oh, I can't read it, held in demonstration of the gaiety and joy that the peoples and inhabitants of the city feel at the new and welcome arrival of his majesty, the king and our Lord expected in a few days time. So again, there's this kind of buildup of expectation. Um, uh, the uh, town criers going through the city accompanied by their uh, mag the magnificent sound of, of trumpets blazing away um, to say, uh, right everybody, time to sweep the streets uh, or um, de decorate the streets and your houses and so on. We have to put on this display, this demonstration of gaiety and joy um, that we are supposed to feel um, at the arrival of, of the king. It wasn't always as simple as that, of course, and we, we, we have to look at these documents and problematize them. Um, but this is, this is um, uh, the kind of record that was kept, and it's the kind of message um, that is also conveyed in the town cries that alert the citizens to these events. Um, <clears throat> Yeah, so um, I've already mentioned how um, statues, paintings, uh, artistic objects, also reliquaries, um, reliquaries, um, uh, monstrances, uh, all kinds of other material objects that were absolutely um, uh, integral uh, to processions, varying according to the nature of the procession and so on and so forth. Um, that these can be, um, these are very closely associated with discursive processes, so that um, a relic uh, obviously um, ties into a whole lot of um, ideas and beliefs uh, about um, the powers of, of saints as intercessors, as miracle workers, and so on and so forth. Um, but these objects, which um, uh, uh, were carried in processions um, uh, were triggers, were, were elements that stimulated the imagination of those attending the ceremonies and thus mobilizing emotions. Um, and although this isn't actually a, a procession, um, this quote uh, from Hernando de Talavera uh, about how every faithful Christian should have in their dwelling a painted image of the cross on which our Lord Jesus Christ suffered and also painted images of Our Lady that provoke and awaken feelings of devotion um, is expressing exactly the same kind of uh, response that must have happened when somebody in a procession saw the figure of a saint or the Virgin Mary or uh, a reliquary passing, passing by. And um, this has been really quite well studied in terms of um, material objects and artistic objects. Um, many of you, again, will be familiar probably with Pascal Rioué's Art Moves, the Material Culture of Processions in Renaissance Perugia, uh, or Peruga, as I've uh, written it. Um, uh, about, again, they, they have this symbolic associative charge which actually reinforces um, uh, the emotional charge of the procession. Um, and, and she argues very convincingly that the fact that these artifacts were displayed and taken in processions um, meant that their 
effectiveness and their affectiveness was actually heightened um, through their being mobile. And, and, and I think this is a very um, important argument because instead of going to a chapel where you might uh, have um, uh, prayed to a statue or a cross, um, these things are being taken out into the streets, out of their uh, church, into the streets and shown to a huge number of people, a, a large proportion of the inhabitants of the city. Um, and so this kind of force is being uh, spread around um, in movement. Um, and I think that uh, it's useful to um, think about, if we can, sound as a material object. Okay, it's not. Um, it's ephemeral and it disappears. But in many ways, it's equivalent, just using another sensory dimension, to those material objects. It is a, it is a trigger. It is something that uh, uh, causes people to focus on the event um, and to uh, associate uh, different discourses, um, both emotional and otherwise, um, with that sound. Um, and this uh, is um, uh, clearly expressed in this document, uh, which relates to the Venetian confraternities and is cited by Jonathan Glickson in his study. Um, in 1553, there was a dispute uh, within the city um, between the city council and the different scuole. Um, the different confraternities, who had by um, uh, totally as, as a norm, um, included uh, instruments of different kinds, musical instruments of different kinds in their processions. And there was a kind of proliferation of this and um, uh, it brought out all the Western people as usual um, in terms of rivalries and competition and poaching musicians from other confraternities and so on and so forth. And it created such havoc. Oh, another aspect was the economic aspect. They were so, um, the, the very best instrumentalists, probably those employed at St. Mark's, for example, um, their services were sought after and literally fought over by different confraternities who wanted to have the best musicians um, to reflect their own honor and economic means. Um, and this resulted in a, um, in a total ban on the part of the city council, another silencing of um, sound in the confraternities processions, um, which of course absolutely stymied them. Um, and they put together a response to this uh, diktat saying, um, using three basic discourses, um, that relate to different emotions. Um, and uh, they were uh, the first, the, the King David um, in the Psalms uh, talks about praising God through music, as you can see in the quotations from the Psalms there, um, and how important this uh, soundscape of um, musical instruments and voices is um, for the praise of God. So it's a very powerful argument. I mean, if you're going to say, right, you can't have instruments that no sound, um, then you're not praising God, really. Um, then the other thing, of course, is that um, these marvellous sounds, um, their variety, um, their uh, occupation of different performative spaces and so on, this encouraged people to go to church because it, it moved them. It moved them to go to holy churches and other sacred places and prompted them to um, devotions, uh, which was a very good thing um, since it took them off the streets and, um, and kept them from being idle. So again, it's another very powerful uh, discourse that is put into the service of the confraternities in their bid to restore instrumental music. And it talks about music having excellent effects um, and as something that is well established um, in cities of the faithful, as they say. And in this city, the city of the councillors, Venice, um, they've been always, it says, the most observant of the divine cult above all others. Well, um, it, it's an argument um, 
but uh, it that pertains to the honor of the city. And again, how could the councillors actually uh, gainsay that? So indeed, um, they weren't successful and um, the instrumentalists uh, were allowed once again to participate in the processions. Um, so yeah, this is going back to the, um, to the royal entry um, and this occasion of joy and happiness that uh, must be demonstrated as part of the kind of um, contract uh, and the negotiations between monarch and city. Um, and uh, this uh, relates to the entry of Philip IV into Barcelona in 1626, um, which also had uh, a lot of political um, tension behind it. Um, again, the king uh, didn't see why he should have to swear to these um, ancient uh, traditions of the, of the Catalans. Um, but uh, in this case, um, the procession did, did go ahead. Um, but um, I am convinced that the uh, writer of the Chronicle, who was a Catalan priest, um, when he says, we the Catalans, it's a bit like we, the Venetians, um, you know, can can uh, praise God through through uh, processions and music and, and ceremony more than any other city, citizens. Here, that it's it's we, the Catalans, we are um, we are fulfilling our side of the pact. You know, we are so filled with joy and happiness um, that, with reason, we can sing with the church, "Hake dies." Um, Hegdias was a, a, a psalm uh, which formed the gradual for um, Easter Day um, that was very much uh, associated with royal entries. And uh, we have another example from much earlier, from 1461, when Charles of Vienna, who was the son of uh, Juan II, who had imprisoned his firstborn son uh, in an effort to try and prevent him from entering to the city, um, uh, a, a, a Catalan poet of the time called Fogasot uh, writes um, uh, uh, a prayer to the Virgin Mary and asks her to intercede with um, the release of Charles of Vienna, of Vienna, who they saw as the rightful heir to the throne. And with this release and with his entry into Barcelona, they would then be able to sing Hake Diez. Okay, um, have I still got a bit of time or is this really going on too long? <laughs> I haven't got too much left um, to talk about, but I think uh, I will uh, resume quite briefly um, this, uh, again, uh, reading the discourses behind the psalm, Hake Dies, its function, um, the way in which it's incorporated and cited in um, uh, chronicles and uh, relaciones of uh, different events. Um, the likely familiarity with the, with the psalm text, at least to some extent, at least to associating it with um, certain functions. And uh, because of the nature of the text, this is the day the Lord has made, let us rejoice and be glad in it, um, uh, being filled with emotional uh, representation and, and meaning, and, and also having um, uh, a, a strong emotional impact. Um, bearing in mind, as Thomas Bugat argues very uh, convincingly, all participants read the procession through the filter of their own experience, derivative of their position inside the coterie and their previous experiences. Um, so it would have been read, uh, there would have been an element of multivalency, would have been read in different ways by different peoples people, but um, uh, there would have been a strong association uh, with that text and with major events such as royal uh, entries. And then in this case, um, the uh, celebrations held for the canonization of San Ramon de Peñafort, who was a local saint and who um, was canonized uh, in 1600 and they um, the news reached Barcelona in 1601, and they immediately put everything on hold in the city 
to um, celebrate this event, event through a whole range of ceremonies and processions. Um, this is the procession um, relating to when they took the remains of the saint from the monastery, the Dominican monastery, um, to the cathedral, um, where they remained during the whole of the festivities, which went on for several months. Um, and I think it's quite interesting how um, the description um, emphasizes the centrality of the cathedral and its uh, and the patron saint Santa Eulalia of, of Barcelona, how it describes um, it went along where the organ was. That's very unusual. Usually you get a description which just says um, to the left to the gospel side or to the um, uh, epistle side or something like that, or to the left and the right. Um, it doesn't say so, but the organ was almost certainly sa sounding while they went through the cathedral to reach the chapel of St. Dominic, um, where there was a small retable, so another uh, art object that would have stimulated devotion and um, emotions of, of, of different kinds. And it's when they reached that point, that performative space, that the, the sound really um, becomes um, spread throughout the city. No, not only in, in the cathedral where the choir sang the motet Hate Dies, um, we don't know who by, but um, uh, a setting, a polyphonic setting of that. And at the same point, um, all the bells were rung and the artillery placed on the, on the seawall uh, was also fired. So we get the sudden sound explosion, literally, um, at this key moment when, um, when the remains of San Ramon uh, reach its temporary resting place in the cathedral. Um, so just to conclude, really, um, yeah, emotional meanings are very hard to pin down. Um, but we have to look at all of these things um, that are suggested here. We have to look at uh, lexical semantics. We have to look at culture, culturally specific metaphors and also ritual scenarios in the way I've tried to do today. Um, uh, but really, if we can tap into um, through analysis of emotional discourses, the processes that took place in an emotional experience, I think I think we can go we can go forward. And um, uh, well, again, the the second part of this quote uh, reinforces that idea. Um, uh, you know that these are socially negotiated things. Um, uh, as we've seen in, in terms of whether it's a, uh, the singing of um, a miserere uh, or events that uh, uh, where sounds actually in, in, incited and enhanced emotions of grieving, of weeping, of sadness, of compassion and pity, and other kinds of ceremony events where um, what is being uh, represented, but also I, these two things are not mutually exclusive. They're being represented, they're being demonstrated, displayed, but um, uh, that becomes the emotional tenor of, of the event, um, not wanting to play down any kinds of arguments over precedence and order and all of those kinds of things that we know about that um, were also aroused by the performance of, of processions. The intention was to create um, uh, a joyous time and Covarubias' uh, um, definition of alegrias, which is the word for um, joyful e events, um, uh, actually associates them uh, completely with uh, royal entries and other royal events. Um, uh, these alegrias, these uh, joyous celebrations, um, uh, also uh, have their roots in certain kinds of sounds, or, or I should say are enhanced by certain kind of sounds, which form certain kinds of soundscapes, um, which are common to those events, which would arrive, which would be expected, familiar to, um, create expectations 
in, in the inhabitants of the city and um, relate to all of those other items that I mentioned at the start in terms of shared knowledge um, and uh, um, uh, familiarity with different kinds of sounds. Um, so that um, maybe in this way, we can get closer to how the inhabitants of the city um, actually interpreted what was going on in a procession. Thank you very much. <clears throat> Wonderful. Uh, thank you, Tess. Um, now, we, we have um, about half an hour for questions, but um, am, am I correct, Emily, that you tabled a five minute quick break? Yeah, I just thought if people want to just pop to the, the bathroom or grab a drink or something that they can do that now just for a couple of minutes, maybe just to let everybody, um, yeah, let the questions be digested and think in their minds, just a thought. Okay, brilliant. Sorry, I was a disembodied voice just then. I didn't realise I still had my camera off. Um, but yeah, if, if um, we take a five minute break and uh, process uh, Tess's really rich and detailed paper and um, come back after break with uh, some questions. <laughs> 